Today, all over the world, we are gathering in large groups and small, in different places and different languages, in buildings and schools, empty spaces and open fields, in our homes and on our phones. Some come together in freedom while others have to meet in secret. Some will sing the old hymns, while others are singing something new. We'll all learn different things from the same Bible and worship the same God in different ways. We are the church, the body of Christ, different pieces molded together by the hand of God. Today, all over the world, we are gathering as one. Well, good morning, Crossroads family. It's so good to see all of you guys here this morning. Let's all stand and let's worship together. Let us bow. 
Today we come for baptism. It's a very important time in the life of our church. Uh, we always like to make sure everyone understands. Baptism is not uh, something that brings this person to salvation. It is the outward sign of an inward decision that's already been made for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, today we're uh, baptizing, I believe, seven candidates that have come forward for baptism. And uh, it's a very exciting time. As you see, we. Uh, had to take a little extra time with Melissa. Melissa's got some challenges that a lot of people would use as an excuse. Uh, and she just wanted to be obedient to what God called her to do and, and follow him. And, uh, and so we're excited about that. And so we're going to, to begin our baptism with, with Melissa. Where's she at? Here, right behind you. All right. Well, it's not like she could go far. Uh, so, uh, Melissa, who is the Lord of your life? Amen. Right. Okay. Upon your profession of faith and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yeah.
Now I'm delighted here. Our next candidate, baptismal candidate, happens to be my daughter Lucy. And uh, so needless to say, we're pretty excited as a family. I'm going to ask you one question. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus' life to make him the Lord of everything you do? Yes. All right. Then it is by the authority of the scriptures and by the power of God we have in Jesus Christ that I baptize you not only my daughter, but now what? My sister in Christ. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the of life. Jeremy. Jeremy's given his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been meeting with uh, Joey, mentoring and, and growing uh, in his faith. And so he wanted to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And Jeremy, who's the Lord of your life? Jesus Christ. Could you be right up here? Could you be right up here? Very good. This is good. Upon your profession of faith and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is Bill, and Bill has uh, been a Christ follower, and he's uh, coming to uh, follow the Lord in baptism by immersion, and uh, his wife will be joining us in the pool in just a moment. Bill, who's the Lord of your life? Jesus Christ. Put your feet right up here against this right here. There you go. Bill, hold your hand up. Let me get you right here. And I'm going to start keep holding. Let me put you on. Uh, upon, his, uh, upon your profession of faith and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Sue, and uh, she has also been a Christ follower, wanted to follow the Lord in believer's baptism by immersion. Uh, Sue, who's the Lord of your life? Jesus Christ. All right. Put your feet right up here. All right. Put your hands up there. Put your hands up there. Put your hands right here. Put your hands right here. There you go. Put this one right here on your wrist. Hold your wrist right there. There you go. Okay. Put your hand right here. Put your hand right here. You ready? Upon your profession of faith and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Jason and his wife Megan will be joining us in just a moment as well. Jason and I got to know each other uh, on, on the last mission trip and, and I got to hear his, his heart and what God's done in his life and what he wants to see God do in his life uh, and it's such a privilege to see he and his wife both come today uh, for baptism. And so Jason, who's the Lord of your life? Jesus Christ. Put your feet right here. You ready? I'm ready. Put your hand right here. Okay. <laughs> You're in trouble. I know. Everyone's got it for me. <laughs> 
I guess it's a thumbs up if y'all want me to bring him up. So, uh, <laughs> Upon your profession of faith and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is Megan, and uh, she also comes and she's given her life to Jesus Christ. She just wanted to be obedient, following believers' baptism by immersion. Megan, who's the Lord of your life? Upon your profession of faith and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here we go. Very good. All right. That is exciting. We're so excited to see that taking place here. Uh, for those of you who are visiting, we thank you so much for coming out and being a part of our service today. We're super excited that you're here to join us in worship today and super excited that you had the opportunity to be a part of a baptism service. So thank you for coming out, being a part. Do us a favor. Let us know that you came out today. We don't want to hound you. We don't want to bother you, but we would like to know that you came. We have a gift for you, and the pastors actually like going out with you, hearing your story, sitting down for a cup of coffee, and finding out more about who you are, and then you can find out more about who we are. So we would love for you to do that. There's an easy way to do that. You can go onto our website under the hub section. You can click on visit and put all your information there, or we handed out little connection guides as you were coming in. It's a what's happening guide, and you can go on there, fill that out, and let us know that you were here as well, and we would love to connect with you. Also, if you guys have any prayer requests, we would love to be able to pray for you, and there's a couple of ways to do that as well. On our website, the hub, you go into the prayer section, click on prayer, let us know what your prayer need is. And there's a couple of things you can do there. If it's a private prayer and you just want the elders and the pastors and the staff praying for you, then that would just go to the private section. But if you want the church to be praying for you, those who have signed up to actually be praying for people would love to be able to pray for you. You can go on, you can do that, or you can do that on the connection guide as well. And speaking of prayer, I just want to take time. We, we probably all have heard what's going on over in Israel with Iran, right? And so before we went any further, we just wanted to lift them up. I know it's a crazy time, and it's a crazy thing that's happening in our world right now. And we want to make sure that we keep them in our memory, in our thoughts, and in our prayers. So let's just take some time, and let's pray for them, and then we'll get to our announcements. Lord, you are creator of all. You know all. And everything that's taking place, Lord, we are looking on going, what is happening? How is this happening? Why is it happening? We don't understand it, but you understand it, Lord. And here's our prayer. We humbly come before you now asking that you would comfort each and every one of those people who are in those nations over there. And let this be an opportunity for them to seek you, to draw close to you, and so that you can come and comfort them. And that they could have a personal relationship with you. And they could know you as Savior, as Father, and as friend. So I lift these nations up to you right now. And pray that your hand of protection would be over them as well. And guide them to you and to your son Jesus. And we ask this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you guys will face your attention to the screens for our announcements. Hello Crossroads family, my name is Marie and I'm thrilled to be sharing all the latest and greatest happenings at Crossroads with you all. Let's dive in. Our next new members class is on May 26th after the second worship service. Come meet our pastors, staff, and elders and learn more about the history of Crossroads, what we believe is a church body, and how you can get involved. Please visit our website for more information and to register for this class. And I think a lot of the key to some of the relationships that are falling apart is because people aren't forgiving each other oh, yeah. in their relationships. And that's an important yeah. element when it comes to having a tight relationship. There will be times you are going to be hurt. We mm -hmm. know that. That's an automatic. You will be hurt. But do you choose to forgive 
or do you choose to be the person who's just going to pout and walk away and say, I'm done with it? Right. Join us every Thursday for the latest episodes of the Reality Is podcast. Discover practical ways to integrate real life experiences with our faith in Christ. Visit the media tab on our website to watch on YouTube or your preferred podcast app. Hello and welcome to Let's Make a Deal. Who wants to play? I do. I do. I do. How many of you have noise in your life? Things that you would want to take out of your purse and put somewhere else? I do. I get a lot of noise from social media on my phone. I have a lot of noise from my friends. I have a lot of noise from popular authors and books that I read. Who wants to trade that noise for God's truth? Yes. I do. I do. Ladies, join us Thursday, May 9th for our salad extravaganza. We'll be playing Let's Make a Deal, and the church will be providing salad for us at this event. We're excited to discuss the common lies that we believe from this world and trading those lies for God's truth. We look forward to our time together and are excited to play Let's Make a Deal. Come join us. Bring your purse, your Bible, and listening ears ready to receive what God has for you. We look forward to Thursday, May 9th. Life groups are groups that meet in homes and at church at various times throughout the week for the purpose of making disciples. Groups gather to study the Bible, pray, and fellowship together. They study the biblical text from the latest sermon, and every member of Crossroads should be a part of a life group because within these groups, we make disciples who make a difference. If you are interested in being a part of a life group, please stop by the Connection Center on your way out to learn more. One of the ways we serve is by giving. If you would like to give, you can write a check and mail it in or find one of the black boxes in the back of our worship center and throughout our campus. You may also give online by clicking on the Give tab on our website. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to give you this week's announcements. Now, let's get back to worship. Oh! 
Okay, let's take our Bibles together this morning and look over at the 8th chapter of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is we're continuing our journey together uh, through 2 Corinthians and a series entitled More Than Enough. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ is more than enough. And so what does this look like? How does this play out in our lives? Uh, today we want to pick up reading with uh, chapter 8 and verse 1 as we're looking at God honoring attitudes in our Christian giving. Now as we look at this, uh, chapter 8, chapter 9 is going to deal with how we treat our money. How do we treat our possessions? How do we treat those things uh, that uh, the Lord has given us or entrusted to us? Uh, and so let's begin to examine this and let God speak to us as only He can. Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1, uh, we're going to read a few verses then we're going to come back uh, and survey several together. Uh, it says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you by the grace uh, or the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, uh, that in great trial of affliction, in the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty, abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, uh, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift of the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only uh, as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete the grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we do come before you this morning, we're very grateful for the day. We just ask now that you'll open our hearts and, uh, Lord, just guide and direct the words that are spoken uh, and the decisions of the heart. If there's one here that does not know you, would today be the day of salvation? And we'll give you the praise for it. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I heard a story one time about a, a mom, and she was wanting to teach uh, her daughter about the importance of giving and, and giving uh, as the Lord would have you to give. And so as they were getting ready to leave for church one day, she, she thought she'd do an object lesson. And so she took a dollar bill and she took a quarter and she laid those in the hands of her little daughter. And she said, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about this on the way to church. I want you to think about this in Sunday school. And then when the offering plates come by today, I want you to put the one in the plate that you think God would have you to put in the offering plate. The little girl said, okay, Mommy, I'll do that. And, and so the mom was very intentional. When the offering came around, she looked away because she didn't want the little girl to feel any pressure. She didn't want her to think, I'm watching you. And so the mom looks away. And, and so they get to the car, and she just can't stand it anymore, right? She's got to know. So she looks at her daughter, and she said, so, so honey, tell Mommy, which one did you decide to put in the plate? And she said, well, Mommy, when you gave me that dollar and you gave me that quarter, I decided right then that I was going to put that dollar in the plate. And, and yet that man up front, he said, God loves a cheerful giver. And I was happier putting the quarter in the plate. So uh, that's, that's what I did. Uh, you know, I hear that little story, and I'll tell you what, I think that's the way a lot of us give to the work of the Lord. Uh, the Lord's happier if I have more and he has less. And so uh, we're going to begin to examine today what it means to give uh, to the work of the Lord in a God-honoring attitude. Now, I will tell you right now, we live in a world today uh, that the idea of Christian giving has been so abused. Uh, it has been literally for sale. You know what? You send me and I'm going to send you blessings. Look, I'm selling nothing today. Okay, I, I'm not making any promises to you today. What I'm telling you is we're going to be obedient to what God calls us to do. We're not naming anything. We're not claiming anything. We're simply walking through the scriptures of what God tells us Christian giving looks like and how that giving should take place. Now, I will just tell you right now, we're going to, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to probably... Um, shake some worlds because there's, there's people that have come up with a mindset or, a, or an idea uh, that says, uh, I have to give God 10% and 90% is mine. Uh, and, and so we get to the point, we sit down with calculators and we figure out how much I owe God. Uh, and I've heard people say, I made my payment to God. 
I go, really? I didn't know he financed anything. What, what, what were you making a payment on? Uh, but I, I hear them talk like that. I hear them say, well, I gave God his, and, and as if it's not all his. I hear them say uh, that, uh, well, I, I do this, and, and, and then they say, I, I give, and so they say it in such a way as if they're supposed to get something back. You see, as we begin to look at the Scriptures today and and next week, we're going to find out that New Testament giving, Christian giving, uh, as we move into this, it's not a percentage. So if you're going to sit down with your calculator and figure it out, you've you've missed it. Uh, It literally becomes give as you've been blessed. Now, when we talk about that, uh, if we're literally talking about that that I give as I've been blessed, then I, I give everything I've got. And because look what he's done for me on the cross. And, and, and if I develop a mindset that if I give him 10%, then I get to keep 90%, then we lose the understanding that it all belongs to God anyway. And so let's go to the scriptures today and begin to understand what Christian giving looks like and do it in such a way that we bring glory and honor to God and that we quit worrying about uh, how much we have or how much we don't have and we recognize and realize uh, that God simply calls us to be obedient. Now, let me remind you what's been taking place, all right? We started back in 1 Corinthians. We, we did that a year, year and a half ago. Uh, we took a break from there. We went to the book of, of Judges, and, and then we came back to 2 Corinthians. And, and so as we begin to deal with 2 Corinthians, uh, we know that Paul was continuing uh, some issues that he's already been dealing with in 1 Corinthians, uh, just some, some hard-headed people. Uh, some some people that just wouldn't listen, wouldn't get it, uh, and and so uh, we dealt with those first seven chapters of him still continuing to deal with hard headed people, uh, dealing with persecution where they are attacking him uh, unmercifully, where he uh, is is being attacked by the ones that are literally selling the gospel. They're selling ministry, if you will. And so he's been dealing with all this. He's been attacked by all this on every turn, at every angle. And and so uh, we dealt last week in in chapter 7, as we wound all that up, we dealt with how do we deal with conflict and what do we do with that. And I told you last week that as we dealt with that, the next thing that he was going to do is he was going to transition out of that and he was going to say now that we've dealt with all these problems, we've dealt with all these issues, now let's get busy, let's, let's do ministry. And, and so we're going to begin looking at what that looks like as we uh, deal with the last closing chapters as we work through 2 Corinthians. One of the things that I want you to understand today, uh, that as you look at this, uh, he's not interested in their money, he's interested in their ministry. He's not interested in, in how much can I get from you. He's literally interested in how much can you give to the work of the Lord. And so let's work through the differences in those mindsets uh, and in those different attitudes as we look at this. And so the first thing I want you to see from our text, honoring God in our giving requires an attitude of generosity. It requires an attitude of generosity. The very first thing he does is he comes out in verse 1. He said, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And so he brings out uh, the very first thing as he begins to talk about the example of these churches. And so when we're talking about the, the churches of Macedonia, uh, he begins to lay out uh, and says, okay, we're talking about Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. And, and so he says, I, I want you to see that I'm pointing to their example. Now, before you think that he's pointing to wealthy people that have plenty, he's pointing to very poor, very impoverished uh, people that are suffering persecution for the gospel. They're suffering for the cause of Christ. Uh, If there's ever been people that had nothing to give but gave everything, it were these three churches. And, And so here we are in this situation. He says, I want you to look at these. I want you to see their heart. I want you to see their attitude. I want you to see that they were not concerned with what was coming their way. They were simply concerned with what they could send out. These were mostly poor people. They were despised. They were marked by persecution. And and so Paul says, now look at this. Now he comes down to verse 2, and he comes to the end of verse 2, and he said, here's what I want you to see. Out of their deep poverty, uh, they abounded in the riches of their liberality. Uh, That word literally means their generosity. 
Okay, now I want you to catch this. It wasn't out of their wealth. It wasn't out of their surplus. It wasn't out of, of, I don't have anything else to do with this. But it was out of their need that they gave to the work of the Lord. Uh, And so he begins to say, now it's very interesting because I I love the setup for this. Because I I want you to listen to how he sets this up. In great trial, affliction, and deep poverty. Now, what does great trial, affliction, and deep poverty equal? According to the Apostle Paul, as he's talking about them, it equals joy in your life. Uh, And he said, so here's the deal. All these hardships, all these difficulties that they were dealing with, but in all of this was the abundance of joy in their life. They were were still excited to do the work of the Lord. They were still excited uh, to be part of this kingdom effort that was before them. Now, it, it's interesting because as you look at this word generosity, it, it kind of carries a meaning. It kind of goes a little deeper than just, just generous, if you will. But it's generous with no motive. Uh, and so otherwise, it's, it's not that I'm being good to you so I can get something back. It's not that what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to give you something because my goal is for you to do something for me. Now, that's the idea of generosity in our world today. Uh, that's our, our whole idea is, is I mean, you, you be honest with yourself. If someone out of the blue does something nice for you, what is your first thought? You know, what are you after? Uh, you know, uh, what, what do you think I have that I can do for you because no one just does something nice? But this word that, that is being used here, it literally explains to us that that generosity is with absolutely no hopes of anything in return. No hopes of getting anything back, which, by the way, it, it just destroys this whole name it, claim it, this whole idea that what I give, I can always look for the windfalls of blessing. Listen to what he said. I do this with no double motive whatsoever. No hopes of cashing in somewhere down the road. And then he goes on to explain that. He said, okay, here we've given you this example. This example are the Macedonian churches, the churches who had absolutely nothing to give, but they gave anyway. And then he goes on to say, let me give you an example uh, or an explanation of what this means. The first thing uh, that we find out of this uh, is that outward circumstance is not what makes a person generous. Now, he comes down to verse 2, and he talks about that liberality, and he says they did this out of deep poverty. And so what he does is he takes and he, he eliminates that whole idea of you being able to say and me being able to say, uh, well, I can't give because I don't have anything to give. Uh, I can't do because I have nothing in me to do with. He, he said, no, here's the whole idea. Your outward circumstances is not What makes you generous? Now, remember, you're giving as you've been blessed. So I'm not sitting here giving you some mathematical formula that I want you to go home and work out. I'm not even sitting here telling you that that what you do, you're going to get some big special blessing and that you're going to get windfall. No, what I'm telling you is it's a heart of generosity. It's simply giving with absolutely no motive whatsoever attached to it. I'm giving because God has done so much for me, because God has blessed me in so many ways. I'm going to tell you, I I don't take away from poverty in America. I don't say that people aren't poor. I don't say times aren't hard. I know there's real poverty, but I will tell you this. uh, As a rule, as a a general rule in America, if if you're hungry, there's somewhere you can get food. Uh, If you're cold, there's somewhere you can get out of the cold. I mean, we have so many programs, so many opportunities, so many ways. Uh, and, and, and I get that, but I don't take away from the poverty. But I have traveled in many places around this world where poverty is real pro- poverty, where there is nowhere to go. There, there is absolutely nowhere to go for somebody to give me food. There is nowhere to go for someone to give me clothing. I mean, I have nothing, and, and there is absolutely no one around me that has anything. And, and so it, I am where I am. And I have been in those places, and I have watched them give 
when they had nothing to give. I have watched their heart. I've watched the way they've served. I've watched what they've done. I, I learned early on uh, when I started doing mission trips 20, 25 years ago, and, and I started seeing people and understanding that generosity literally has nothing to do with our circumstances. So the second thing I want you to see uh, as we look at this is ability is not what makes a person generous. It's not ability. Notice we come down to verse 4 or verse 3 and he said, I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, beyond their ability. And so what he's saying is, is it wasn't just within their means. It wasn't just within their ability. And, and so what too, too often what we call Christian giving is giving out of our surplus. Uh, it's giving that it costs me nothing. Uh, and so what happens is, is I, uh, I say, okay, I got a little extra money this month. And, and so, but let's, that's not what he's talking about. As a matter of fact, when we go into Luke chapter 21, we find a great example of this uh, when we find the, uh, the story of the widow. And what you have here is you have the wealthy people uh, in this time and at the, during this uh, period in Luke 21. They would bring their money into the church in bags and uh, they would take that money and historians tell us that they would make a big show a big noise they would throw it up in the in the trumpet that they would give in and it would clang and it would bang and it would make all this racket and look at me look what I'm doing look how much I'm giving don't I deserve a pat on the back don't I deserve credit look at all this and so this was, this was how they lived. This is what they did. And so, so the widow came in, and she had a couple of mites, not even a, a penny, uh, and, and she threw it up in there, dropped it in there, uh, no noise, <laughs> no attention, no everybody looking, no everybody paying attention. And then the Lord asked the question. He said, okay, which one of these really gave? Well, what do you think the answer was? Well, the ones that put all that money in there. He said, no, the one who put the least in there. And the difference that he brings out for us and the difference we have to understand, it was not giving out of a surplus, uh, it, it was giving out of necessity or, or out of the, her own need. And, and so when, when we find ourselves in that situation where we're giving and there's no sacrifice whatsoever to that gift, there's no sacrifice in what we're doing and it's just out of surplus. I mean, we're not even going to miss it. There are, there are people that can give 10,000 and they won't even know they gave 10,000 and there's people that if they give $10 away they're going to know exactly uh, where that they gave $10 away because their budget is going to suffer like that and so when we look at this this is what Christ is talking about uh, it's not ability that makes you generous and I'm going to point more out uh, for this in just a moment you know I've heard people over the years I've been guilty of saying the same thing if I made more money I could give then I remember years ago when, when Joy and I first got married, I, I mean, I, I tell people all the time, I would not as a pastor with a clear conscience perform the marriage for two people as broke as Joy and I was when we got married. Uh, we were going to live on love. Um, lasted 30 minutes, and we got real hungry. Uh, and so we found out that wasn't a good plan. Uh, but, but you know what? I, I'll never forget, uh, Joy, was, uh, Joy was raised uh, in a... Uh, a very solid Christian home. Her mom and dad just, I mean, literal saints of God. They, they raised her uh, to give. They raised her to be faithful. They raised her to, to do. I grew up in church. I went to church and, and always heard about giving. But it didn't mean near as much to me as it did her to be faithful uh, with what God had given. And I'll never forget. I mean, we, we didn't have any money. As I said, we had none. And i never forget one day, she said, we, we need to give something to the church. I said, church needs to give something to us. I, what, are you, what are you talking about? And so she said, well, well we just, we, we, need to, we need to give something to the church. And, and so, I, I mean, yeah, I gave it begrudgingly, uh, kicking and screaming. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it wasn't that I was looking for anything. It wasn't that I was looking for return. But it just became a habit in my life, just like it, it did in, in our home. And it became a habit in who we are and, and what we do. It's not your ability. It's not all the extra money that you have. It's the heart that you give it with. I remember when we, when we first got married, and I know a lot of you sitting in here are going to say, how old are you? I'm old. We'll leave it at that. Uh, and, and I remember, though, when, when we got married, and we would sit around and we'd say, if, if I could make $10 an hour. She was a full-time college student, and, and I was working, and, and if I could make $10 an hour, we'll have it made. I mean, that's what I would tell her. If I can get to $10 an hour, then I'll give something to the work of the Lord. 
You know, when I finally got to $10 an hour, I found out I was spending 12 so it didn't matter. Here's what we do. We, we, we argue that if I made more, I'd give more. But let's be honest with ourselves. As I make more, I spend more. And, and so when I get a surplus, I always find a place to put that rather than being generous, rather than being able to give to the work of the Lord. The next thing I want you to see is the secret of true, true generosity rest in our availability. Now, I've already pointed out to you, it's not about your ability. It's not about your circumstances. It's not about, listen to me, it's not about your bank account. So if you walk out of here today and you say, well, all the pastor cared about was our bank account, you didn't hear a word I said. It's not about your bank account. Listen to what he tells us when we get down to verse 5 because this is the crutch of it all. And, and he said, uh, not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. And so the very first thing that, that we need to understand about generosity, it's about availability. It's about making yourself available to the work of the Lord. It's about making yourself willing and, and being able uh, and, and saying, I will, I will do. But you see, what happens is, is, is we, we lose that secret of generosity, of, of being generous with our time, being generous with our talent. You know, I've told you before, what you... What you see on, on Sunday morning is, is such a minimal fraction of what it takes for our services to take place each week. Uh, you, you don't even see 10% of the people that it takes to, to make our services work and to make things happen. And uh, you, the, the baptism this morning, you, uh, you, you saw the end result, but you didn't see all the work that it took to get to that result. And, and that's all I'm trying to get at is uh, the availability is not put me out front and let everyone see me. The availability is, God, whatever it is. Whether I'm out front, whether I'm out back, whether someone knows my name, whether no one ever knows my name, I want to be available to the work of the kingdom. You see, that's how important that is. That's exactly why he tells us it all starts with availability. I will tell you uh, that when Joy first suggested that we should give money to the church and I opposed it, I will tell you what changed my whole attitude toward my uh, monetary giving uh, was my giving of myself to serve in the church, to give of myself to to fill holes and fill gaps. I I know that uh, early on uh, we... I began to teach a Sunday school class, and uh, then I began to get involved in, in other areas. Still didn't have any money, uh, but, but found myself serving. And as I was serving, I found myself much more willing to give uh, because I, I was, I had, my whole mindset had changed. And so I want you to understand the true secret is availability. I want you to know that, uh, you know, just a, the little thing to always remember, although the tithe is not what we've always made it out to be, but, but it's your time, your tithe, and your talent, okay? Uh, it's, it's giving of your time to the work of the Lord. It's giving of your talent to the work of the Lord. Uh, you look up here, you, you, you see the praise team, and uh, you see them come in, you, you see them up here uh, for the, the two services, actually three services, they do Wednesday night as well. But what you don't also see is the time of practice that they're here on Tuesday night for the couple of hours they do that. You don't see uh, the time they spend at home and on their own and, and on I could go. You, you see all the other people serving and all I want you to realize and all I want you to get is it's the availability. It's not just your money we're talking about. We're talking about you as an individual. We're talking about all of you, not just a fraction of you. And this kind of goes back to that mindset of I made my payment to God as if I, I paid him off. And since I paid him off, I don't have to do anything now. And so this is why he eliminates that. Second of all, I want you to see honoring God in our giving requires an attitude of sincerity. An attitude of of sincerity. So we have our generosity and our generous attitude has to be a serious attitude, not something we fabricate for others to see. So the first thing he does is give us a test of that. So what does it look like? First of all, it always is voluntary. 
Uh, it's not out of compulsion. It's not uh, that I'm giving because I want the attention. I'm giving because I want people to see this. I'm giving because that bald-headed man said I had to. Uh, I mean, I don't want you doing it for all the wrong reasons. You're doing it simply voluntary. I'm doing this because God has blessed me so richly, giving of my time and my talent uh, and my finances. That's just natural for me. It's not that I'm hoping to gain. It's God has done so much for me, I can't help but do this. That's what he's talking about. Notice he comes down to verse 8 and he said, I speak not by commandment, but I am testing, uh, uh, I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So he tells us that this is voluntary. He said, I'm not, I'm not speaking to this by commandment. I'm not standing up here browbeating you. I'm not standing up here threatening you. He said, what I'm doing is I'm giving you an opportunity to do this because it is in your heart to do this. Now, he's given an example. Remember, he's pointing back to the Macedonian churches. I'm uh, not going to redo all that, but, but don't lose sight of the fact that these were impoverished. These were desperate. They, they did not have money to give away they didn't have food to give away they didn't have clothing to give away but they gave it away uh, and and so he said I want you to look at that example it's all voluntary it's a heart matter and then he talked about it being sacrificial so he comes down in verse 9 and he said look at the Lord he said though he was rich he became poor now, what's he talking about there? Because we talk about though he was rich, and then we look at our uh, scriptures, and we know that Christ said, I, I, the birds, they, they have a nest. I, I don't even have a home. Uh, the foxes have a hole, and I don't have a, even a home. And even at his death, he didn't even have his own grave. They had to place him in someone else's grave. And, and so he said, uh, so what is he talking about though he was rich? He left the portals of glory. Remember, he was all God. He was all man. And he left the portals of glory. He left King of kings and Lord of lords to come to this earth and take on flesh and to live and to die for our sins. And he did that. He became poor that we might be rich. We might be rich in his grace. We might be rich in our salvation. We might be rich in our eternity. And he said, here's what I want you to see. Since your giving is sacrificial, the sacrifice goes back to what Jesus Christ did for you. I don't know about you, but... I could give everything I had and then go borrow all the money I could possibly borrow, and I still can't give to the level of the sacrifice Jesus Christ made for me. And so when he's talking about this, he's reminding us that it's a heart attitude. And so it's not that I'm, again, I, I keep going back to, it's not that I'm trying to make my payment to God. It's not that I'm sitting down with my calculator to make sure. I don't sit down with my W-2 at the end of the year and, and then sit down with how much money I gave the church to, to make sure I hit my 10% number so I can walk out and say, well, I, I did my part. Instead, he's telling us it's sacrificial, it's sincere, it's giving from the heart. Now, as we look at that, he kind of comes back and he said, there's a, a testimony to this. There's what I want you to see. And he goes back to verses 6 and 7, and he said, okay, here's what's happened. I sent Titus, and I sent Titus because a year ago, you made a promise. A year ago, you said you would take up an offering and it would be ready when I came back through in order to work the, do the work of the ministry in, in Jerusalem. And now here I am a year later and you still haven't taken up your money. Now I want you to remember this, what's taking place in Jerusalem. Because what's happened is uh, the, the economy is tanked. It's tanked in Jerusalem because of famine and drought. And so they're hungry. Uh, they, they have no food. They have no resource to get food. It's also tanked because Rome uh, made it a policy to drain the money out of anyone they conquered and anyone they took over. And so the taxation burden. So you're talking about everyone in Jerusalem was suffering famine. Everyone in Jerusalem was suffering the uh, excessive taxes levied by Rome. But the Christians went one step further and they were suffering extreme persecution. Now, remember, Christ said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you, all right? So it wasn't a surprise. And so they're suffering this extreme persecution that's taking place. And out of that, he comes back and he said, I, I, you said 
you, you were going to take up money to help those people in Jerusalem and build this bridge of fellowship, but you've not done it. Now, the reason I bring that out is uh, it, there's a big difference between promise and performance. Uh, there's, there's a big difference in I, I will do, I will do, I will do uh, until it's time to do it. And, and so he's, he's laying that out. He said, you, you made a lot of promises, but you've just not carried through with that. And we see that in our world today. We, we see this whole idea, this whole concept of talking a lot about what we'll do for the work of the Lord, talking a lot uh, about what, what I would do if, but not actually performing, not actually doing. You know, when we think about that and, and we understand if, if we can't be faithful with a little, how are we going to be faithful with much? And, and so this is, this is what we're looking at. The best way I've heard this defined, and, and I'm just going to borrow it because it simply reminds us, God sees the heart gift, not the hand gift. It's the Pharisees had already been through that. They had already played their game, throwing their money up and getting all their attention. Uh, Christ, Christ saw the heart. Uh, he, he wasn't worried about how much it was. He saw the heart that it was done with, and he said, no, nah, nothing about that. He saw the heart that the widow gave with such a small amount, but she gave her all. He said, that's what I'm talking about. And so I just want to take just a moment and take four truths about sincere Christian giving. Uh, this, came, uh, th- this came out of a, a, a writing by J.I. Packer, a theologian that uh, has gone home to be with the Lord. And, uh, but, but I just want to pull these out real quickly, and I, I just want to bring out how important it is to understand that our giving goes far beyond what we put in the plate. First of all, Christian giving, giving is a discipline of discipleship. It's a discipline of discipleship. You're not giving uh, or part of your giving is part of your discipleship, is part of your maturing, part of your growing, part of your understanding that God will provide, God will take care of me, that God will uh, walk me through this. And so, so it is a matter of discipleship. It's a matter of growing in your faith. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, uh, the Apostle Paul lays out there and he said, you know what, I've learned to be content in whatever happens in my life. He said, I've had plenty uh, and, and I've been content. I've had absolutely nothing and I've been content. I've had plenty to eat. I've been full and I was good. I've been hungry and I was good. And so he's laying out the whole secret to all of that is contentment. Contentment is part of our Christian discipleship. It's part of growing in our faith. It's part of growing as we know and learn and understand uh, what God tells us uh, and how important that is in our life. And so it's essential to our discipleship. Second of all, I want you to see that Christian giving, giving is management of God's money. It is management of God's money. Uh, you see, when we stop and we really begin to understand, it's not mine to begin with belongs to God. And 10% of it doesn't belong to God, 90% of it mine, it all belongs to God. And and when I really began to understand that, and and I began to see exactly what he's telling me, and I realized that everything I have, my home, my cars, all my toys, everything I have, everything that that we'll call accumulated on this earth, it's not mine, it belongs to God. And so if I'm accumulating, if I'm gathering, if I'm, if I'm storing back so I can say, look at everything I have, well, we got a bigger problem. It's almost sad. I, I tell you, the, the, some, some guys were walking through our neighborhood, and, uh, and they stopped, and they, I had my boat, and, and it was sitting there in the driveway. And one of them walked by, and he said, you know what? I like coming by your house. I said, why do you like coming by my house? He said, man, you're the man with all the toys. Uh, I said, oh, I got a problem here. I got to work on this. So I let the garage door down. But anyway, uh, you know, we, we find ourselves accumulating stuff for us. But do we take this stuff and then use it for the kingdom? Do we take these, these things that we accumulate and, and then try to use them for the kingdom? Because we begin to understand whether it's my money, whether it's my home, whether it's my, my truck or my toys, it doesn't matter. I'm simply managing God's stuff. And if I will get that picture then it changes everything, and it gives us a whole different idea and a whole different concept about what we're doing in life as we work through this. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, he tells us to lay up, lay up. 
uh, you know, I, I, I've heard people tell me, say, well, you can't take it with you. I said, well, you're right. You can't take it with you, but you can sure lay it up. You, you can put it out in front of you. And so when we stop and we think about that, what, what do you want to do with it? I, I knew a man, and uh, he, he, he doesn't live he doesn't live around here, and it's, it's just a true story. I mean, this, this man is worth millions upon millions upon millions. Uh, and he gives a lot to the work of the Lord. And I asked him one day, I said, what do you want to do with all that? I said, do you want to die with all that? I wasn't expecting the answer. He looked at me just as sincere as he could. And he said, yes. I said, really? He said, absolutely. I said, what do, what do you want to die with all that for? He said, I'm, I'm going I'm to leave it to the kids. And, and I said, well, Daddy, I'm, I mean, you know. <laughs> I'm sitting here talking to him, and, and he's talking about all this money, and he's going to leave it. And I said, all they're going to do is fight over it. That's all they're going to do. They're, they're just going to fight over it. So I, I went home. I told my daughters, I said, girls, I'm going to leave enough to bury me, and we're done. Listen, what are you, what are you leaving it for? What do you think you're going to do with it? You, you, can, you can hoard it up. You can store it up. You can say, look at all that I have in the bank. Or you can say, man, I'm going to put this to work for the kingdom. Now, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with saving for retirement. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with, with, with putting and, and having some, some nice stuff and a nice vacation. I'm not, I'm not saying that if you enjoy life, suddenly you're a horrible sinner. That's not what I'm talking about. But how much is enough? How much are we just going to keep storing back? Christ said, lay it up. Send it up. It's a ministry of God's money. So when I... Think about that, and I understand that my giving is simply being able to do ministry with what was God's anyway. It never was mine. And so if I can send it to the work of the Lord, then, then I'm able to do ministry. Uh, the church is able to do ministry. Uh, other, other ministries that I give to are able to do ministry. And it's not a matter of me uh, hoarding it back and holding on to it. Christian giving is ministry with God's money. I know it's hard for us to, to rationalize, and sometimes we, we kind of want to differentiate, and, uh, you know, sometimes we're, we're, we're just, we, we get, all, we'll get all hung up. You know, one of the first things I always want people to know and understand is God's not broke. You've, you've never, I've been your pastor almost two years now, uh, and never in that time have you heard me beg for money, and you never will hear me beg for money. God's not broke. As a matter of fact, this is the second message directly relating to money that I've brought. And the last time was in 1 Corinthians when Paul talked about money. That's why I preach through books. You see, I learned a long time ago, and, and Pastor Ed and I were, was, was talking earlier this week, and uh, one of the things that, that uh, we're both confident of is, is if we've got to beg people for money, we've totally missed the point. Uh, what happens is, and when we begin to understand that the giving of money is a matter of maturity, it's a matter of discipleship, it's a matter of growing, and, and guess what? When somebody's walking with God, you don't have to ask them. And it's so important that we understand that. And, and so it's doing ministry with God's money. I, I will tell you, I thought, well, you know what? Maybe we can save a little bit of money. So I'll just be honest with you. I, uh, I called the power company and I said, hey, we're a church. Can we not pay a bill? They said, no, send money. So we're, uh, we're stuck. You know, we got to pay bills just like everyone else. We got to do work just like everyone else. And, and so it is doing ministry with God's money. It's doing the things. I, I hate wording it this way, but there's no other nice way to put it because it's a fact, and that is it costs money to reach people. We got missionaries that uh, we support overseas, and guess what? It costs money to reach people. We've got uh, four of our college students that are going to be heading off on a mission trip. We've been giving you opportunities to give uh, to, to work with them. It costs money to reach people. We got mission teams that go out of our church. Uh, we're hoping to, to step that up and send more and more teams out. It costs money to reach people. And, and so I don't apologize for that because whatever we have and whatever we do, guess what? It's doing ministry with God's money. The one thing we're not going to do is abuse it, take advantage of it, or, or misuse it. And so, so it's doing ministry with God's money. And then Christian giving is a mindset regarding God's money. And, and I could have just said that and been done with it. It's a mindset regarding God's money. When I really begin to stop and I understand, guess what? It's not my money to begin with. It's God's money. And, and that goes beyond just something I say because it sounds good in a sermon and it really literally becomes a heart, then I, I don't have to worry about it, you know. Uh, I, I, I just, uh, it, it's just one of those, uh, one of those things that, that we get to. You know, one of the uh, things, you know, you hear people say, well, we were so poor we didn't know it. 
uh, when they were growing up, you may or may not heard that. I hear people all the time say, well, man, we were so poor we didn't know it. I tell people, well, that's pretty cool. I was so poor that I was fully aware of it. So uh, we, uh, we, we get there. Listen, it's, it's getting to that point that I quit worrying about all these things, and I say, it's all God's anyway. And if he wants me to have it, cool. If he wants me to live in a house, fine. If he wants me to live in a tent, whatever. I will do whatever. I'll live whatever. I'll, I'll, I mean, it's, it's his anyway. And then we start seeing ourselves as a steward and not an owner. And when I see myself as a steward and not an owner, I lose the ownership of it. I lose the possession of it. You know what a steward does? A steward manages someone else's property. At the end of the day, that steward owns nothing. But I will tell you right now, he, he wants to be mindful of using it correctly because he's a steward of it. And so this is how we treat God's money. We, we just treat it in such a way. And let me give you the final thing, and this is going to bring us into next week, so we're going to cover this very quickly, and that is honoring God in our giving requires an attitude of equality. An attitude of equality. Very interesting as, as he lays this out because we come down to verse 13. Uh, and as we get down there, he said, For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack and their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. Now, let me just go ahead and, and, and deal with, the, the, if you will, the elephant in the room. He's not talking about socialism. He's not talking about comp- uh, communism. He's not saying uh, put it all in a pot, shake it up, pour it out, everybody take an equal portion. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about right here is in your surplus, when you have the overabundance and all you're doing is stacking it back and and you see someone in need and you have no heart of generosity, you have no care, no compassion, you're not sitting there going, well, I I don't have money to give them, but I got time to give them. I I might not have the time to give them, but I got talent or I got got, uh, money to give them. It's that whole benevolent idea. It's that whole attitude of generosity and the motive for for our giving, my time, my talent, my tithe, remember, is not any other reason than it's not mine. It belongs to God anyway. You realize I'm not guaranteed one minute on this earth, right? And every minute that I have to live on this earth is a gift from God. And so am I going to take that gift and squander that so I can spoil it on me and ignore others, or am I going to take that gift and use it uh, for, for the good of others. This is what he's talking about as, as we look at this. The motive for our giving. Then he gives us a, a really good example as he, as he comes down. And so as he's dealing with this, uh, he goes down to verse 15 and he goes, you know, he who gathered much uh, had nothing left over and he who gathered little uh, had no lack. So he's talking about the manna. He's talking about the manna in the wilderness. And, and he's saying, here's, here's what happened. God provided. He provided what they needed. And if you go back and read it in Exodus 16, tell me what happens when they got greedy. Uh, They wanted to collect a little extra, wanted to store back a little bit so they didn't have to do anything tomorrow. It rotted, and and it stunk, and they had to deal with that. Uh, It wasn't hard to figure out who uh, who, who was not following what God told them to do. But you see, what happens is, is, is he said, I'm going to provide just enough. I'm going to give you just what you need. And this is what we're going to do. Listen, God's going to give you just what you need. He's, he's not going to leave you hanging. He's not going to put you out there. And then he tells us in verse 14, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this in a measure of giving. Your surplus will take care of someone else when they have nothing, and their surplus will take care of you when you have nothing. And he said in the Christian community, uh, you're going to take care of one another. You're going to provide for one another. And so when we see that and we begin to understand, it's not a formula, it's not a calculator that determines what I give, it's a heart of generosity. And so I'm going to give as I've been blessed. I'm going to give not because I'm gaining favor, looking for favor, looking for payback. I'm going to give because how can I not after all that God has done for me? And this is what he's talking about. And so as Joey is coming, how do we deal with this today? What do we do with this in our own heart? Again, we're going to continue this thought next week. You see, what happens is is a heart of generosity says, time, tithe, talent, I'm going to do whatever I need to do. Just want to serve God. But when we get beyond that, you know, one of the, I read something several weeks ago and I actually jotted it down. 
What happens is, is we put ourselves in a situation and, and you hear someone say, it's not about the money, it's about the principle. Well, let me tell you, it's always about the money. Uh, we, can, we can hide it in any conversation we want to hide it in. We can make it sound any way we want to say, say it, but it's always about the money. And the question is, is how is it about the money? Is it about the money because I, I'm, I'm generous or is it about the money because I'm, I'm, I'm stingy? But it's always about the money. It's always about our time, our talent, our, our tithe. What do we do with what God has blessed us with? You might not have more money than anybody in the building, but what about your time? What about your talent? What are you doing with what God has blessed you with? And so when we think about that, we need to always understand that it all starts with salvation. It starts with giving our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then from there, it just is a matter of growing in who he is. And so let me just ask you to bow your heads just a moment. Please, no one looking around. Just, just, wanna, just want people to have an opportunity just to be very honest between them and God. I'm not going to come to you. not going to embarrass you. not going to say anything to you. It's your decision, not mine. But I do want to pray for you. Is there one in here today that would say, you know, Pastor, I'm just not certain of my salvation. I, I hear you talk about generosity. I hear you talk about walking with God. And, and honestly, I, I don't know that I even have a relationship that I can even say I know what that means. And I just want you to pray for me. Anywhere across the building, just ease that hand up real quick. Say, pray for me. I just, I want to, I want to know what that means. And I'm not certain of salvation. I see that. Anyone else? I'm not certain of what that means. Maybe you're here today and this might be the first time that you've ever really stopped to think about what, what do I do with what God's blessed me with? What do I do, not just my finances, but, but my whole being, all of me, what do I do with what God's blessed me with? And maybe right now, right where you're at or talking with one of our counselors in the back, talking with me up front, but you just want to resolve that. You want to say, God, I, I want to be faithful with all that you've given me. Not just a little bit, but all that you've given me. I just want to be faithful. And so I want to pray for you, and at the end of this, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond as, as God lays on your heart. I have no idea what that might be. Uh, we're not going to drag this invitation out. We're just going to give you a chance to respond as, as you see fit. You can step to the back. We have counselors back there, and I'll be up front. So let me pray for you, and then you respond as you see God calling. Father, in this moment of invitation where you draw to yourself decisions that need to be made, I don't know what they are. I don't know what you're doing, but I know you do. And I just pray that you would break our heart for the things that break your heart. Uh, Lord, make us generous in what you call us to do. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand to sing now, what decision do you need to make today? I give myself away. I give myself away. So you. Can he use me? I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. You know, I realize today the message is it's a very personal decision. It's something that sometimes we actually have to get alone with God and we have to let God continue to process out in our life. Am I being faithful? Am I being a good steward? Not of one area, but of every area of my life. Am I being a good steward of what God does in my life? Listen to the words of that song. I give myself away. And it's absolutely impossible to give the way God calls us to give if we hold anything back. So we want to give ourselves away. And so I'm going to leave you with that today and let God continue to do what only He can do in our hearts and minds as we look for faithfulness in every area of our life. Joey, if you would dismiss us, please. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine He's been my portman in the fire time after time. I'm 
full of His Spirit and washed in His blood and what He did for me on Calvary is above and enough. Sing it out loud. Say, I trust Him. God bless you guys. You have a great rest of your weekend. And as always, we look forward to seeing you guys next week and throughout the weekend life groups. Goodbye now. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps. So this is my story, yes. And this is my song, Lord. Praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. Cause I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Cause I trust in God, my Savior.